So whether you're in a mixed faith marriage or know someone who is, remember that peace and love are key and trust God with the rest. Think about the incredible mystery of what Christ has done with us. What an amazing gift. We have the ability to focus on our needs of our spouse. And if we're single, we have the ability to focus on the needs of our Lord completely. Thanks to this deep emotional strength we find in the love of Christ, there's no reason to grumble or complain about where God has us. For those who are married, the key is to see your spouse transform from the wrong person to the right one. Understanding that the perfect person, Jesus, came for us even though we were all imperfect. I wanted to let you know we had a good time camping last week. Hope you didn't mind seeing me on video instead of in person. Um, we, it did rain that last day and we had to take everything down in the middle of the rain. So that was kind of fun. But uh, we had a great time. We had a worship service there that morning and we had three visitors from the camp who came. They heard us singing. Two of them, two of them heard us singing, stopped in. And the third one was our, our neighbor and we asked her to join us and she did. And we did a, uh, so we did a service. We talked about Psalm 3, David's um, prayer when he was leaving Jerusalem because of Absalom. And then we did a prayer walk to all of the um, campsites of our people. So uh, we, we really enjoyed that. It was great. And, uh, but it's good to be back. And let me, I didn't get my sermon pulled up yet. But we'll get a pull if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of First Corinthians. And we are in chapter 7. You know, there have been many things, many things in this world that this world has attacked. I believe that, um, I believe the world system, which is run by the evil one, is attacking motherhood. I believe that the world system is ta attacking marriage. I believe the world system is attacking, attacking what God says we are. In the beginning, God created them male and female, man and woman, he created them. I believe the world system is attacking our families with social media, wokeness, many other things. I think social media is attacking marriage godly marriage. Sin has so distorted our ideas of marriage that many single individuals feel that they cannot thrive without entering into marriage. And on the other side, there are many people who are married who think it's unbearable to live and be married. We're, we're a world of discontents. Our, our modern society has so many wrong ideas of what marriage should be like. I, you know, I've been to a lot of weddings. I've done a lot of weddings. And, and I sit there and, and, and I, I stand there sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm watching these people. And that day, that marriage, that wedding day is a beautiful day. Everybody's happy. And I always wonder, do you really realize the troubles you're going to have? Satan wanted nothing more than to divide. He wants nothing more than to divide. He wanted to divide Adam and Eve from God. He, he divided Adam and Eve from each other. When they found out that they were, no, they were naked, they hid from each other and they clothed themselves in leaves. God's, God wanted nothing more than for man and woman to be together in the garden with him. And Satan wants nothing more than to divide us. He divides us in so many ways. Especially right now, we know he's dividing us politically. I was watching something this morning and it really hit me. God is not Republican or Democrat. You understand that God only has, looks at us in two ways, saved and unsaved. Saved and unsaved. 
those that are going to spend eternity with him and those that have rejected him. And that's it. Whether you are Republican, Democrat, Independent, doesn't matter. But Satan wants to divide us. And he wants to destroy marriage. And he wants single people to be discontent with their singleness. The culture in Corinth was not a whole lot different than our culture is today. It was all about pleasure, all about indulgences. Seize the day, carpe diem. Do it now. Paul had already talked about sexual immorality within the church community. It had been rampant. Some people were even visiting prostitutes because it was seen as normal. It was widely accepted in the community. We talked about that last week. Those of you who were at camp, you need to watch the video. I get a little hot and heavy in that, don't I? I think I hit the pulpit one time. I don't think I've ever hit the pulpit in person, but nobody was in here, so I felt I could do that. But it's important. People in Corinth didn't really see marriage as a place for sexual gratification. They didn't see it as that was what God had created it for. So in response, some Christians swung to the other extreme. What they become is they became over, overly ascetic, which means no sexual relations between a husband and wife. A gift. They took what God had given as a gift, and they said, we don't want it at all. It's a lifestyle that was characterized by abstinence from any sensual pleasures. It wasn't just sex. It was any sensual pleasures. A lifestyle that often its purpose was to pursue spiritual goals, or so they said. Now, while it's very important to pu push back against the culture of hedonism in our society, it's especially since it was influencing the church, there's a danger in going too far in calling something that God calls beautiful and holy, the relationship between a husband and a wife, calling it evil, which is what the society is doing today. There's a very libertarian and pleasure-seeking attitude towards sexuality today in our world. And believe me, it hasn't just started since the 60s. It's been there since the start. It's just become more apparent and more out there in public. So on the flip side, there are religious people who, also, who are often labeled as overly strict or, or prudes, you know. The hedonistic, hedonistic mindset of our world is saying, go ahead, do anything you want. If it brings you pleasure, do it. The body doesn't have any moral significance. So long as everyone consents, it's all good. It's a very Gnostic idea. The Gnostics were um, people during that time, what they believed is that there was a separation between the spirit and the body. The body didn't matter. What you did to the body did not matter. What mattered was the spirit. God says, no, it all matters. Because the problem with this idea is that it strips away the deeper, soulful connection of intimacy, reducing people, people to mere animals. I, I just, I, I struggle when I see something on TV and they're saying, well, we're just animals. Oh, we may be part of the, quote, you know, animal kingdom, but we're not just animals. There's so much more to us. I'm, no, I'm much more different than my cats, than a dog. But also on the other side, the asceticism, asceticism of the time says don't have 
intimacy with anyone. Married, don't have intimacy. The body is seen as morally corrupt. Even in marriage, sexual intimacy is something viewed as a weakness or even sinful. This approach denies a fundamental part of our human being, our physical selves, by making everything too spiritual. So we need to not look at what the world says. We need to look at what the Bible says. So Paul's going to address this question, that questions that are asked him. We don't know what all the questions are, but we get an idea by his answer. We don't have that letter. So there was a, a Corinthians letter before 1 Corinthians, or at least it was a letter that was sent to Paul, and we don't have it. So Paul's responding to it. Because he says here in verse 1, he says, Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, he says, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, I want to let you understand, Paul is not saying that it's sinful for a husband and wife to be intimate. But he says, there's something good in celibacy. Celibacy is not just about being married or having sexual intimacy with, with your wife. It, it is a, a deliberate choice to dedicate yourself more fully to serving God. And this lifestyle can be seen as a way to live out your faith with undivided attention and commitment. See, there's something, there's something beautiful when a husband and wife come together in intimacy. And I don't just mean in the bedroom. I mean the intimacy of closeness, of holding hands, of hugging, of kissing, of what, all those things that make our kids go, ooh, you know, when they see us do it. It, 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 it draws those people together. So what Paul is saying, that it, 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 well, as beautiful as it is, as, as a gift of God that is, there's something to be said about being celibate. To where you're not, you're not divided. You're not being pulled by that other person. And you're able to fully devote yourself to God. In Matthew 19, 10 through 12, Jesus speaks about different kinds of eunuchs. Eunuchs, <laughs> let's see how I can say this. A eunuch was somebody who worked in the palace around the queen and the queen's maids. They had to make sure there wasn't any funny business going on. So they did certain things to the male so he couldn't do these things with these people. I guess that's the best way I can say it. They were eunuchs. Daniel was a eunuch. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all eunuchs because they worked in the king's palace. Jesus says there's different forms of this. He says here, he says, the disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. He's talking to them about how a man shall leave his wife and how that's going to be the man's focus is his family, his spouse. And they say it's better that he not marry. And he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. So we know that celibacy is a gift that's given by God. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. Those would be David, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. That's the choice that you make to not be intimate with anybody. So that you can spend your time serving God. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Again, it's a gift. So Jesus acknowledges that not everyone can accept the calling to celibacy. But for those who can, it's valid. It's an honorable choice. And Paul is going to echo those words in verse 2. He says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Paul is saying because of the prevalence of sexual immorality in our world, if you, are, if you have not been given the gift of celibacy, if, if, if you don't, can't do it, then it's better for you to get married, whether you're a man or a woman. So what this does is this establishes the importance 
of marriage as the appropriate context for sexual intimacy between a man and a woman. It must be in the area of marriage.